Good morning. Uh, I hope all of you survived uh, chapter 14. Uh, that was a tough chapter, right? There was a lot of stuff in there all about oscillations. So, um, hey, we are down to chapter 15 and 16 for the course. Uh, just a couple chapters left. This chapter is looking at what we're going to call wave motion. And chapter 16 is a follow-up with sound. And so these two chapters are, are pretty closely related. And I have to say, uh, a lot of the stuff that we learned in chapter 14 is going to get used here in 15 and 16. So we'll see more of that stuff showing up in this chapter. We did a, a really good thorough job, I think, with chapter 14. So I, I'm thinking you guys are going to be well prepared for what we uh, take a look at here. All right, it's, it's about wave motion. And of course, the easiest thing to show wave motion is a water wave, which is actually not a good representation in general of what we mean by wave motion. So it's pretty, uh, it really is. So uh, waves in physics are any kind of a disturbance that propagates through some kind of a medium. So what's happened here is, here is this material. We have this sample of water right here, and someone created a disturbance. It looks like somebody threw a rock in or something. Uh, so a disturbance got started. Now, back in chapter 14, when we put something into motion, um, it would oscillate. And that's what's happening here, is that at the location where the stone hit the water, that region of the water begins to oscillate. But in chapter 15, when we're looking at waves, now we're going to be saying, but that disturbance propagates. It does not stay localized in one region. What happens is this part of the water is in contact with the surrounding layer and the surrounding layer and the surrounding layer. And so as you move away from that, um, Every part of the water is going to feel some sort of an effect from that stone that was thrown in, and that's what we call a wave. Now, when you guys hear the word wave, I know it's, it's like, oh, it's this wavy thing, like, but it's going to turn out that that isn't necessarily the case. You don't have to have something that has this wavy look to it. Anything where a disturbance propagates um, is a wave. And what it's propagating through is the medium. And when you think about it, the wave is the medium, right? I mean, when you go, what, what is the wave going on here? It's the pattern of water. Uh, once we've created a disturbance, uh, water, individual pieces of water that were at some kind of an equilibrium are uh, pushed to the side but there's a restoring force. So the water gets pushed to the side and then it restores back to equilibrium, but it overshoots. And so what we're ending up with is chapter 14. We're ending up with oscillations. And so in this case, uh, we have these oscillations and uh, they propagate away from one part of the medium to the next part of the medium to the next part of the medium uh, because the medium's all in contact. All right, so a nice set of photos, really, really pretty. Um, here are the uh, sections within the chapter. All right, here we go. So uh, we'll come back and look at some water waves. Uh, we're going to go down to, we're, we're going to start with looking at something that's a little simpler. Uh, let's say that we have a string, and we hold onto the string, and we put a little bit of tension into that string. And then what we can do is we can create a, a single pulse. And that's what's happened here. So this, this is the disturbance. So here is, you know, the string is going to be the medium. Ooh, I even have this written down here at the bottom. The string is going to be the medium. And then we're going to create a disturbance. And it's going to propagate. So when I take that piece of string or that, that cord or that rope, and I move it up and down, that motion doesn't stay localized it gets communicated to the rest of the string. And so what happens is, when you lift this up, you create different displacements away from equilibrium. In that first picture, everything's nicely at equilibrium, but this now moves things away 
from the equilibrium point. Now, in these later pictures, see how the, the tension is being maintained. Uh, the person is maintaining some tension in the string. But the disturbance, because this part of the string was lifted away from equilibrium, it lifts its neighbor and its neighbor uh, and the one after that. And so we're going to have parts of the string that are falling, but other parts of the string have been lifted up. That's what's going on. So there's wave motion, and the wave motion, we haven't got that identified here, but we should put an arrow in here and go, ah, that's the direction of the wave. This is showing the individual motion of different locations within the medium. And so the string here, see that part of the string? It's coming down at that speed, and this part's going down at that speed. But this part's coming up at some speed, and this is coming up at some speed. And then it propagates. So this part came up, and now it's coming back down. This part's going up in this picture, but now it's coming back down. And that motion has been communicated to the rest of the string. Okay, so anything like this. Now, notice in this, there's not a bunch of curves going on. It, it's... it's it's one pulse. So waves could be just a single pulse, or it could be a whole series of pulses that are um, generated and that propagate away from some source. So let's see if we can pick out the uh, key words here. It looks like they've, they've written those, they've highlighted those. The pulse shows that it begins with, now they're calling it a vibration. Uh, Vibration is fine. My personal preference is to think of this as a disturbance within the medium. Again, vibration um, uh, reminds me of what? Um, kind of this uh, familiar, everyday use of the word of wave. And so we want to, you know, we want to use, anyway, vocabulary that makes sense. So it uh, starts out with, with some kind of a disturbance. Uh, and it's transmitted, it propagates through uh, internal forces, within forces within the medium. So between different parts of the medium, uh, there are forces taking place. Different parts of the medium are in contact with each other, and they, are, they have forces acting on them. Um, and then in the medium. So continuous wave structure. Okay, it says here, now this, this is a, a, another tie-in with chapter 14. If the disturbance, or the vibration, is simple harmonic motion, then that means that it's going to be periodic and it's going to continue. We're going to have a series of pulses, and if it, if it looks like a sine or a cosine function, then the propagating wave will have that shape of a sine or a cosine. Okay, so, so whatever is happening here, whatever the disturbance is, whatever the pattern of oscillation is here, that's going to get projected along the length of the medium. Okay. So, and then there at the bottom, disturbance propagates through medium. All right, here are some wave uh, vocabulary. Now, notice they've just jumped right in and started to represent this as uh, what looks like a sine or a cosine function. In any case, it's a periodic uh, wave. So they're saying that, you know, this point along here represents the equilibrium of the medium. If the medium were to settle down and, you know, damp out the oscillations so that they go right back to equilibrium, it would, you know, the equilibrium is along that black line. Now, this part of the medium has been displaced uh, in this direction. Now, when you look at these waves from the side, they kind of call them crests and troughs, but, but you know, um, if you turn the whole thing sideways, which you could, then which one's the crest and which one's the trough? So anyway, there are displacements away from uh, equilibrium. I know that the crest and trough is handy to think of in terms of water waves, but it turns out water waves are a little different. Water waves are actually a surface effect or a boundary effect between materials. And so um, they certainly follow much of the same, many of the same ideas that we have here, um, but they're a little more complicated uh, because of the motion of the medium 
at that boundary. In any case, uh, I, I, I don't think I'm going to be using the words crest and trough, but I will be using the words amplitude. So amplitude tells us what are the displacements away from equilibrium, just like chapter 14 all over again. Now, the picture we have here says that, again, if everything were to settle down, the medium would be along that line because there's a wave passing through, different parts of the medium have been pushed sideways, in this case, um, compared with where they usually would be. Now what we can do is, um, okay, amplitude A, that sounds good, wavelength. Uh, a wavelength is the distance of one cycle when we're looking at, at how the wave is uh, projected um, across distance. So the axis here is distance. It's, it's like the x-axis. What we've done is we've taken a snapshot. We've taken a snapshot of where the medium is uh, at a particular instant. And what we're seeing is different parts of the medium along the length of the medium are uh, displaced differently. Some parts are displaced in one direction, some parts are displaced in the other. So that's a time snapshot. Now what happens if we allow time to continue? Well, what would happen is this profile will continue moving, let's say, to the right. If the wave motion is to the right, then we maintain this profile, but the profile uh, travels to the right at some speed. So what would that would mean is that individual parts of the medium, like we saw in the, in the slide before, uh, this is going to become, this is going to start oscillating downwards. This one hasn't quite reached its peak yet. And this part is going to come up and reach the peak later, and then this one will reach the peak later, and this one. And so, not all parts of the medium are moving together. There is this synchronized process where uh, individual pieces of the medium are oscillating back and forth. Uh, every individual piece, but they're uh, synchronized in a way where it appears um, as if there's a profile moving in some direction. All right, so um, wavelength we talked about, amplitude, frequency. What is a frequency or a period? Maybe a period is something better to start with. Uh, if we have a sine or a cosine wave like this, uh, or a, you know any periodic wave, a period is the time it takes any individual piece of the medium to oscillate back and forth and complete one cycle at that location. So that's what a period is. Now a frequency would say if I take an individual piece of the medium, I can count how many cycles per time that this uh, it goes through. So how many cycles per second does an individual part of the medium um, go through? Uh, so that's what frequency corresponds to. Now, because of the way the profile is moving forward, during one period, what happens with an individual piece of the medium, this goes down, this comes back up, and the profile shifts so that this, uh, you know, this amplitude location moves to this spot. So during the time of one period, this entire profile moves forward one wavelength. Okay. So what does that say about the speed then? Well, the speed at which this is traveling would be uh, the wave, the profile effect. At what, what speed is the profile effect traveling? That would be the distance of one wavelength over the time of one period. So the velocity, the wave velocity, that's what this is, is lambda over period. Uh, period and frequency are inverses, so we can write that as v is equal to lambda times the frequency. Now, this is a relational formula, and by that, it's not a formula saying that the velocity depends on what the frequency and the wavelength are. Uh, the velocity, the speed at which uh, waves, disturbances, propagate through a medium, 
depends on the properties of the medium. Okay, so we'll see formulas for that. Uh, we'll be taking a look at that. Uh, here's two different types, uh, two different patterns of waves that are possible. Uh, we could have, now there's a motion of the medium that we have to keep track of, and then there is a motion of the wave. What direction is the wave traveling in? Now what we've got here is that one of these um, you know, kids' slinkies, and uh, what the person's doing is they're creating a periodic oscillation here with this slinky, and so what's happening is the slinky goes back and forth. That back and forth motion has been propagated so that if we take a snapshot, that's what it's going to look like. So a wavelength would be from one amplitude to the next, or one crest to the next. Um, and the direction of the wave would be here. But the motion of the medium, if I look and pick a point right here, that individual piece, it's not going forward. It's oscillating back and forth right there. That's referred to as a transverse wave. If we have a medium that's going from side to side as the wave moves forward, that's transverse. Now, here's another interesting one. Again, they're doing this with a, with a, a slinky. This time, the person's pulling back and then pushing forward on this slinky. Now, what that does is it creates regions of compression and expansion. And that's a wave. So there's nothing there that looks wavy, um, but it's a disturbance that's propagating through a medium. Now, in this case, the motion of the disturbance, in fact, the motion of any individual piece of this uh, medium is in the same direction as the uh, propagation of the wave. And that's referred to as longitudinal. So this shape uh, is transverse. This pattern of media, medium motion is uh, longitudinal. Now, uh, what happens here is that solids, you know, if I had a, a solid material, a, a, you know, a, a block of steel or something like that, uh, you could imagine that the steel could have, uh, could have a longitudinal compressions. So if the steel were hit on the end, you would imagine that that could propagate through. Uh, you can also imagine that steel could be disturbed from side to side. So uh, something that's solid can uh, support transverse and longitudinal waves. Uh, if it's a gas or a liquid, if it's some kind of fluid, fluids don't support transverse waves. And the reason why is, is in a fluid, if something gets pushed to the side, there's not really anything to pull it back. Um, so if something gets pushed to the side, the wave tends to propagate in that direction. So with liquids and um, gases, uh, we're limited to uh, longitudinal, um, longitudinal waves. Now, you know, again, water waves, people are going to go, but wait a minute, what about water waves? Uh, water waves look like this, and water is a liquid. Again, it's a surface effect, so uh, it's a boundary between water and air. And so uh, they're using gravity to pull the water back into equilibrium. So there, it's true, there's a gravitational force pulling the surface of the water, the, the part that's gone up higher out along the surface, uh, to pull it back to a, an equilibrium position. All right, here's a nice picture uh, of some longitudinal waves. This is sound, and it, this chapter is called waves, but, you know, the next chapter is called sound, and they're kind of, you know, the Sound is um, a, a, a propagation of a disturbance. Here's a drum, and here is the, the drum membrane. So that's the uh, membrane on the drum. And when you hit the drum, the membrane moves back and forth. Now, there are different patterns uh, as to how that motion of the drum head can move back and forth. They've shown uh, kind of the simplest one, where the whole drum head moves forward, and it compresses. See, these are all air molecules. Uh, a little bit of exaggeration here, but they're creating a compressed region. And then the drum uh, head uh, moves back, and that creates a region of, of uh, expansion. 
And so what's happening here is you're creating a region of compression, and this region of compression on this side pushes uh, nearby air molecules, and so the compression propagates through the air. Now again, individual molecules of the air are not consistently going in that direction. Uh, individual molecules of air are moving back and forth. Uh, different compressions get set up. Now uh, this is um, this is you know this this is is um, sound, and so uh, here's a compression here, here's a compression here, here. The compressions were formed when the drum head was moving in this direction. The expanded regions um, were created when the drum head was moving back. But in any case, the pattern propagates, but the individual air molecules are not. They're just moving back and forth uh, within what's going on. Here are some formulas uh, to uh, tell us what the speeds are. Um, you can take a look at some of these derivations. I think the textbook has some derivations uh, sort of justifying why these formulas work. Um, in lab, we'll, we'll um, try to think of why we do. So we're going to make use of some of these formulas in lab uh, when we are uh, looking at uh, uh, standing wave patterns. Um, so this is the tension set up in a string. So what this is saying is uh, there's a velocity formula. If we set up a transverse wave on a chord, uh, that's given by tension divided by something that we call mu. Now, mu is a linear mass density. What it is, is it's mass per length. You could think of that as m over l, or dm dx. Um, wh what's important on this is, um, is how, much, how heavy are the objects? How much inertia do these objects have? And so, more, a heavier string has more inertia, and that slows down uh, the velocity effect. So the velocity of the waves are going to be influenced by how much mass there is. Now tension uh, creates a stronger connection between different parts of the medium. And so what's happening here is as the tension goes up, speed goes up. As the uh, mass goes up, the speed drops off. So, uh, and that's a formula we're going to come back and take a look at. Uh, when we start looking at um, more examples with, with strings or, or, or um, um, yeah, with instruments, uh, violin strings, piano strings, something like that, we can come back and, and uh, figure out how to get a certain pitch from a string. Pitch is related to frequency. How can we get this string to vibrate at a certain frequency? So here we are. Uh, it's a pulse on a wire. In fact, um, this is a copper wire. It's 80 meters long, so and 2.1 millimeters in diameter. Now I, I guess copper has pretty sturdy properties to it. 80 meters—that's a good distance, right? That's like most of the way across a soccer field or a football field. And uh, this is only 2.1 millimeters in diameter, so a couple millimeters. So we're unraveling this copper wire, and uh, you know, uh, the copper wire is stretched between two poles. Now, I guess what they're going to do here is they're going to put tension into it. Uh, it says that a bird lands at the center point on the wire, and that creates a disturbance. And the disturbance travels out in both directions, and then it reflects at the ends and comes back. And uh, it comes back in 0.7 five seconds after landing, uh, what's the tension in the wire? So uh, what, what could be simpler than this, right? So here we go. Uh, here is the 80 meters. Here is the point where the disturbance, the bird lands right here, and the wave propagates out. And then where it's connected at the ends, the, the wave will reflect. So we're actually going to get the wave traveling 40 meters and then 40 meters back. So 
all the way out to here, all the way back to this location. Uh, that is going to be 80 meters, and that's going to happen in 0.75 seconds. So apparently the wave speed for this copper wire, uh, we're measuring it out to be 107 meters per second. Now, the formula they gave us, this is a little confusing, I, I realize, so this is really the formula they gave us to show how tension and uh, mass are related to the wave speed. Uh, this is really just showing what numbers uh, we ended up with. And so, um, let's do this. Let's take this formula and bring it down to here. It says that in order to calculate the tension, what we can do is calculate the uh, linear mass density and multiply that by the wave speed squared. So let's, let's follow that. So here is this string. Now it says that it's an 80 meter string. It's made of copper. And so the L value here is 80 meters. Uh, the radius is going to be half the diameter. That's going to be 1.05 millimeters. 1.05 10 to the minus 3 meters, and then uh, th this is a little uh, tricky here. So what we've done is we've said, okay, let's say that the string has a certain mass to it. Uh, the mass is going to be the density times the volume. Now the density is going to be the density of copper, and so I looked up the density of copper Oh, it's down at the bottom. So here it is, 8,940 kilograms per cubic meter. So I got to put in the density of copper. That tells me how much inertia there's going to be. And uh, then I have to find out what the volume is of that string. Now, the, the string, or the wire, it's a cylinder, right? It's circular cross-section, and it's really long, but it's still a cylinder. And so uh, we can take the pi r squared and multiply it by L. And so the mass of that entire string is given by rho pi r squared times L. The density times the volume. Now to get to mu, mu would be taking the mass and dividing out the L. So we just cancel out the L. Uh, it turns out that the linear mass density, the mass per length, is given by the density of the material, the density of copper, times pi r squared. And so that brings us to here. There it is, I'm putting in the density, I'm putting in pi times 1.05, 10 to the minus 3 meters squared. And so mu is working out to be uh, 0 0.0310 um, kilograms per meter. Now that sounds a little high. How, how, I gotta go back and double check this. This is, uh, this is saying that for every meter of copper wire, that's about 31 grams. So, seems a little high. Maybe it would be that much. Uh, I was thinking maybe, maybe it would be 3 grams, but this is saying 31. So, I'll double check that, you guys too. Um, in any case, so if we take the mu times the velocity, which we calculated from observations, this is suggesting that the tension in the copper wire is 343 newtons. Okay, so that's how much tension we would need to have the wire have the wave speed that we're talking about. This two, two millimeter diameter Hmm. All right. Questions on that? All right, here's some other velocity formulas. So if we have a bulk material, you know, a block of something, then what we can do is we can take the elastic modulus, divide that by the density, uh, take a square root, that gives us a velocity. Or if we have something that is uh, a liquid or a gas, we could use a bulk modulus. So, going back to chapter 12, uh, looking at some of these numbers for elastic and bulk modulus will give us an idea of how fast the waves, the disturbances, are going to propagate through the medium. 
All right, here's just a couple of examples of using the formula. I pulled out the uh, bulk modulus formula uh, air. I looked up the bulk modulus for air. Um, the bulk modulus for air uh, I, in a table I saw is 141,800 newtons per uh, meter squared. So the bulk modulus, if you remember, tells us uh, how, how much resistance a material has to being compressed. Uh, and that's not, an, that's not a, a very big uh, bulk modulus. If you compare that with the bulk modulus of water, uh, the bulk modulus of water is like, you know, 10,000, more than 10,000 times bigger. So it's very difficult to compress water, not so difficult to compress air. So that compressive property actually tells us how individual molecules, uh, how directly in contact they are. In air, the molecules aren't necessarily directly in contact with each, each other so much, but in water they are. Meaning that if we create a disturbance somewhere, how long until the neighboring regions of that material um, know that a disturbance has happened? And in air, it's not so quick, but in water it's much faster. In steel, it would be super fast, right? If you disturb one part of steel, the other parts of the steel know about that pretty quickly because um, the material is so stiff, uh, the material is so rigid that uh, one part knows what's going on with the other part uh, pretty, pretty rapidly. So putting in the density of air, now air doesn't have an especially large bulk modulus, but it also doesn't have a very large density. And so putting those numbers in, checking units, so the Newtons have kilograms, meters per second squared, the uh, kilograms cancel. Uh, it looks like we're left with meters squared over uh, seconds squared, and then the square root gives us meters per second. Uh, and 343. So um, that's our prediction for the speed of uh, propagation of a wave in air. Oh my gosh, you know what that is? That's the speed of sound. Okay, so we can actually, from the bulk properties of air, we can uh, calculate what the speed of sound would be in different conditions. Now, in air, at different temperatures and different pressures, uh, the bulk modulus could vary. Um, in water, not so much. So at different temperatures, uh, the density is not going to change a lot, and the um, bulk modulus probably is not changing so much either. In any case, putting the numbers in for water. Now, we know that for water, it's going to be a, you know, 800 times more dense. So water is 800 times more dense than air. Uh, shouldn't that slow the process down if we have something so much denser? But the bulk modulus more than compensates. So those molecules of water know right when something happens, the message gets out among the molecules very quickly. Uh, and so this turns out to uh, calculation here, the prediction is 1450 meters per second. And that's, you know, very close to uh, measured values for the speed of sound in water. Sound travels much faster in water than it does in air. And if we did the same thing for steel, we would find that the speeds are in the thousands, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 uh, meters per second for the propagation of sound. All right, whoa, that's a long, long problem. It's all about echolocation, uh, sensory perception used by animals such as bats and whales and dolphins. Animal emits sound, a longitudinal uh, disturbance, a longitudinal wave reflects off the objects and uh, returns. So uh, let's see. Oh, look, it's a whale. So here's a whale, and uh, it says that there is is this food or is this um, an underground, an obstacle? Yeah, so this is an obstacle uh, that the whale wants to avoid. So uh, sending out these. Um, high frequencies. Now these frequencies uh, that we're looking at here, this is 100,000 hertz. Uh, human hearing, uh, we are sensitive, our hearing is sensitive 
to uh, frequencies between 20 and 20,000 hertz. And we'll talk more about that in chapter 16. But uh, this is ultrasonic, right? This is much higher. Human hearing cuts out at about 20,000 hertz, and that's if you're young and your hearing is still good. Um, and so this frequency is much higher. So that's the frequency we're looking at. Now, the wavelength is what they want us to calculate. Is that right? Um, let's see. Uh, the time that it takes for the uh, wave to travel out and return, remember this is a longitudinal wave, it's a compression wave, uh, 100,000 of these compressions are being generated every second because of something vibrating, right? So, um, if we're speaking, then we have vocal cords that are undergoing vibration, and that's setting up the, um, the disturbance. So, something is creating this ultrasonic effect, goes out and back. The distance here would be 2 times L, that's going to be 200 meters, and then we want to find out um, what the, the velocity is. So uh, now here I've used a bulk modulus that I looked up, not for water water, but for ocean water. Now ocean water has compounds in it. It has uh, different um, sodium and chloride ions, and so it's got a lot of different materials that are uh, dissolved in the water. It makes it denser. And apparently it gives it a higher bulk modulus. So putting the numbers in here, uh, the speed I came up with was 1,511 meters per second. And uh, that, that's our prediction as to how fast this is going to happen. And so, let's see, this is what they were actually asking. I guess this part was asking me about wavelengths. And so wavelengths I can get from here. I can now plug in the value for the speed and divide through by the frequency, and that will give me a wavelength. So it says 100,000 of these disturbances every se second are being set out, 100,000 pulses, you could think of it as. Um, how much distance is there between one pulse and the next? Because that's a wavelength. So a wavelength would be distance from one pulse to the next, and uh, by taking the speed and dividing through by the frequency, uh, the prediction is that it's 1.5 centimeters. So there's only 1.5 centimeters uh, between each one of these pulses. The, the, the disturbance, each pulse, is traveling at 1,500 meters per second. That's like 3,000 miles an hour or more, right? So, you know, 3,000 miles an hour, 1,500 meters per second uh, that they're traveling out. But they're being produced so frequently that there's only a, a centimeter and a half between each one of the pulses or wave fronts that are created. Uh, and then I guess in part B what they're asking for is how long will it take for the return signal given that there is an obstacle a uh, hundred... Oh no, I didn't double it. I can't believe I did that. Okay, so it looks like I've only solved for one direction. How long is it going to take until the sand goes out and reaches the obstacle, well, it's 100 meters away, and it's traveling at 1,511 meters. So it's going to take 66 milliseconds to go out. It's going to reflect. It's going to take 66 more milliseconds to come back. Sounds like 132 milliseconds, 0.4, uh, based on the numbers we have here. All right. So yeah, we've got these speed formulas, and uh, you pick out whichever speed formula is relevant for the particular uh, example that you're looking at. All right, here we go. Uh, types of waves, transverse and longitudinal. Let's take a look at some more of this. Earthquakes produce longitudinal and transverse waves. So earthquakes are happening in solid material, and uh, we can get both the compression waves, and I think it's the compression that travels faster, right? It's like... The compression waves are called P waves, and the S waves are sideways, and they take longer. Something like that, if P waves, S waves. Anyway, earthquakes do produce both longitudinal and transverse waves, uh, and it's solid material. But only the uh, longitudinal uh, waves can propagate through a fluid. 
the fluid has no restoring force, so kind of what we've talked about before. Um, now, there, there's a region in the core of the Earth that is fluid. You know, there's a molten uh, liquid portion of the core. There's a center part of the core, which we, we, we expect is solid. Nobody's been there. Uh, but one of the ways that we can analyze what's going on is when there is an earthquake, you can see how that affects all of the earthquake stations around the entire globe. So, you know, a large earthquake could get picked up all over the planet, and uh, the P waves, I hope I'm getting this right, better double check this, the P waves uh, can't pass right through the, the liquid portion of the core. Or uh, the S waves can't. Is that right? I do have to go back and take a look and make sure I get those straight. Uh, anyway, we can kind of map out what's going on inside the core of the Earth uh, using the pattern of disturbances uh, from earthquakes. Now, here's the water waves, the surface waves uh, that we talked about. So it's a boundary between two different materials. And so you can see the motion of the water involved with these waves is more complicated. Now, the waves, what we see are the waves coming on shore, but this is what individual parts of the water uh, are doing largely. Okay, we've got to talk about energy being transmitted. Um, this energy transmission is going to be important for us, so let's take a look. Now, again, this could be a longitudinal or a transverse wave. So we've got some kind of a region where a wave is propagating through a medium. And as the waves propagate, energy does get transported. So what's happening is one part of the medium pushes on its neighbor, uh, which pushes on its neighbor, which pushes on its... Energy gets propagated by that. If you guys have ever been to the A's game and you do the wave, how do you do that? And so, you know, everybody's sitting in their chairs and... Uh, Somebody who wants to start the wave stands up and sits down. They represent the initial disturbance. And then that's the signal for the next part of the medium to stand up and sit down. And then the next part of the medium to stand up and sit down. And the next part of the medium to stand up and sit down. And what that does is it produces that synchronized pattern um, of people standing up and sitting down. And it creates the appearance of a pulse going through the crowd. Now, if people are really paying attention, and as soon as they see their, their neighbor stand up and sit down, they start right away, then the wave speed is faster. But if you've got people who aren't really paying attention, and they're watching the game, right, uh, and they happen to notice, and they go, okay, I'll stand up, I'll stand up, then the wave speed is going to be slower. So that has to do with, you know, the, the elastic properties of the material, uh, is how close individual parts of the medium are paying attention to the neighboring parts. Now, when you do the wave at the A's games, um, is that transverse or is that longitudinal? Right, and so it, it's transverse, right? So the motion of the wave is along the seats, but the individual pieces of the medium are moving up and down. Now, next time when you're at the A's uh, watching the game and, you, and somebody decides to do the wave, say, Sure, let's do the wave, but this time, you know, we always do a transverse wave. Let's do a longitudinal wave, just, you know, for something different. Uh, how would you do a longitudinal wave? And you'd go from left to right, right? So rather than standing up and sitting down, you could do a longitudinal wave where you go left and right, and then that uh, indicates to the person next to you that they need to go, you know, left and right, and then you can watch that wave propagate. I think it would be really cool to do a longitudinal wave, you know, the A's or the Warriors or something. Um, you know, just so, we're not always doing transverse waves. Um, anyway, let's take a look at the energy that's being propagated uh, with this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a small piece of the medium. Now see, that just looks like a block, but that's actually the medium. And this red thing here is just representing how the medium compresses and if it's a longitudinal wave, how is the what, where are the compressed regions and where are the spread out regions? Or if it's a transverse wave, then it says that, you know, this part of the medium has shifted this way, and so different parts of the medium are being shifted back and forth as the wave goes through. Now, to calculate how much energy we've got, 
we can go back to chapter 14. So remember, with these sine and cosine uh, waves, they're like sine and cosine oscillations taking place in the medium. And so what we saw back in chapter 14 is that if we take a, a certain region uh, and isolate that, treat that as an object, well, the energy would be 1 half k times a squared. Now, that's a little complicated because what's the k value for the material? Uh, the k value is actually related to the elastic properties. Uh, things like elastic modulus and bulk modulus can be uh, shown to give us an effective k value for that material. But there's an easier way to get these formulas. Now, they've just kind of magically, I'm going to say magically, come up with this formula. So I'm going to follow up here and we'll take a look. Um, the diagrams here are nice, and so I think these are really useful. What we're going to do is we're going to calculate how much energy is stored within a certain region of the medium. And then what we can say is during a time, T, uh, if the, the profile is moving at a certain speed, then there's a certain distance uh, that shifts. And so we can draw a line here and calculate the rate at which energy is transported across that boundary. Let's take a look and see. We can, we can flip back and forth as needed. Now, there's two different types of uh, energy transport uh, that we want to take a look at. The first one that I want to take a look at, it's, it's not here in the, in the uh, slides uh, provided, uh, it would be for a string. So here's a string or a wire, and here we are standing next to it, and we've drawn that line. And what we're doing is we're looking at a short section and saying how much energy is stored in just this short section of the wire. So to calculate that, okay, so here's a little section. We're going to call that dx. Now, the rate at which energy crosses that boundary, that's the power. So I want to know dE dt, how much energy per time now, to calculate that in terms of wave velocity, what I've done is I've used a trick here. We've used this before back in, oh, back in kinematics, I guess, huh? Uh, we put a factor of dx here and dx here. Now, the dx over dt on this side, what's dx dt? You go, that's a speed. That is the wave propagation speed. That's uh, the rate at which this section of energy crosses that boundary. So that much uh, energy, the energy that's stored in here, is moving at a certain speed, and that's dx dt. Now the energy that's stored in there would be dE dx. Now that's like an energy density, or an energy per length. If we can calculate how much energy is stored along a short length, of the wire, uh, we could plug that into here. This is just the speed of the wave. Uh, we have formulas for that already. So here we go. Here are individual pieces along that wire, and they're all oscillating back and forth, or maybe they're going sideways. Either way works. So um, I'm going to treat this as a, I guess I got it set up as a compression. So what we can do then is we can write down formulas for uh, the position of the medium as a function of time, the velocity as a function of time, and the acceleration. In fact, we, we did that last chapter. This is chapter 14. These are oscillations. So let's say that we use a sine function to represent an oscillation. Maybe it's longitudinal, or maybe it's transverse. Either one works. Uh, the maximum displacement is given by the amplitude. So we need to know what the amplitude of the um, oscillation is. And then for velocity, that became omega a cosine omega t. Now the Vmax value is omega times a. Now back in chapter 14, we said energy of oscillation is given by 1 half k a squared. So we could work in terms of amplitude, but again, the little k value that's a little tricky to calculate. So instead of using the potential energy 
to determine how much energy. Let's use kinetic energy. If we write 1 half mv squared, where v is equal to v max, that would be the total energy in the oscillation. And uh, here, we're going to be fine because we can calculate what the mass of this is. We can figure out what the mass of that wire is. And then uh, V max is given by omega times A. Now that's squared, so we're going to need omega squared uh, times amplitude squared. Now, this is assuming a finite length of wire. So if I have a finite length, I can take the mass. Uh, I could take the mass of that entire wire if it's, if it's got uh, oscillations going on through it, if, it, if it's all in wave motion, and uh, this would tell us how much energy is stored. Now what we want is how much mass is in that short segment dx. So I'm going to scale this down to dE is equal to 1 half. Now when I look at this, uh, the uh, omegas and the a's, those are finite values, but the m can be scaled down. So if I only took a short section of the string, of the wire, it would only have a mass of dm. And then what we can do is say, well, the energy, dE dx, the energy per length, that would be given by 1 half dm dx. So I just divide both sides by dx. And uh, what was dm dx? Anybody remember dm dx? Oh yeah, that's the linear mass density. So this uh, dE dx, the amount of energy stored in a short segment of the wire, is one half uh, mu omega squared a squared. The units on that are going to be joules per meter. How many joules of energy are stored per meter, per length, in the wire. So we can bring that together. We can take the DEDX formula that we just uh, derived and then add on the velocity of the wave and, and there it is. So there is our power formula. Now this is one dimensional. And by one dimensional what I mean is the energy is being propagated along a, a string or a wire. Something we, we can treat as just a one dimensional object. Uh, and so the units here work out to be joules per second, which are the same thing as watts. Now, we've done power before, so uh, we should be pretty familiar with that, but I wanted to do the one-dimensional case first, uh, because now we want to come back and look at, at three dimensions. So let's do that. So here we are, uh, coming in with... Now what we've got is we've got a big block of some material. And there is a disturbance, a wave, propagating through the material. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a slice of the material as that energy propagates through. Now what changes in this example is instead of calculating energy per length, we're calculating energy per volume. So uh, the energy per volume, the joules per cubic meter, are given by one-half dm dv, whereas in the one-dimensional case, this was dm dx, how much mass per length. This one is going to be how much mass per volume. Now, mass per volume is just standard density. So we don't have to do the linear density stuff. We can just do the three-dimensional standard mass per volume. And so the energy per volume, as a wave passes through our, our block of material, one-half rho omega squared a squared. So that's our DVD, uh, DEDV. Now, we're headed towards something called intensity. So in three dimensions, rather than talking about uh, power, we're going to do power per area, and that's what we call intensity. So power units were joules per second, um, area units are meters squared, so intensity must be joules per second per square meter, uh, also known as watts per square meter. So there's this new quantity, we're going to call it intensity, uh, for, to, help, to help us think in terms of the uh, rate at which energy is, is being transported 
through a material. Now, uh, the intensity then is going to be power per area, but notice capital A is already representing amplitude. So capital A is telling us how much back and forth motion individual pieces of the medium have. So rather than use air, big A for area, what they're doing is they're using big S. I think they used it. Yeah. So this is surface area. So it's the area of the cross-sectional surface. A little confusing, maybe. Um, I actually have a hard time with, uh, for, for me, notation. If I start fiddling around with the notation, I can really confuse myself. Um, anyway, we're going to use S to represent a cross-sectional surface area. Okay. Oh, and that's the one-dimensional case. Here is three dimensions. Uh, so we can take the power. Now, the power was dE dt, and if I divide through by the area, that's 1 over s. And then i got to find out what dV is. So dV is this much volume. So that much volume, it's, it's dx in this direction. Ooh, I need to write dx in there. So it's dx in this direction, like it was before, but now there's a cross-sectional area that needs to get included. And so this is the cross-sectional area times dx. And then when we go to calculate uh, intensity, we'll use the same trick as before. Uh, this time, what we'll do is take uh, the volume, dv, is s times dx. So when I take dE, d volume, I'm going to add a d volume here. And I'm going to add an s dx here. So the s dx here matches the dv here. Now the s that we have here cancels this s. And so we're left with dx dt. You guys remember dx dt? That's the speed of the wave. And so what we've done then is shown that the intensity can be written as an energy density times the speed of the wave. If I take an energy density, if I've got some material and it's got this much energy stored per volume, and then I give that a velocity, that gives me intensity. So uh, putting all those pieces together, the intensity is going to be uh, this, one-half rho omega squared a squared times the speed of the wave. So the speed of the wave, now that's for three-dimensional objects, and that's intensity, and that's going to be in the units shown. So uh, that's really handy. We can keep track of the rate that, and I know, I know there's homework problems on this, um, the rate at which energy is transported. Now, when we're transporting energy through these disturbances, remember that there are going to be different geometries. Uh, in some cases, you can treat it as if they're just kind of a beam. You know, the energy is just being transported in that direction. But in many applications, we have to consider the energy being propagated away from some kind of a central source. You know, if you have a, a disturbance that takes place at some location in a medium, you could have energy propagated out in all of these directions. Now, a lot of times what we do is we just go, okay, Let's just say it's uniformly distributed in all directions. What's going to happen then? And uh, the intensity is going to drop off like 1 over r squared. So the surface area, in this case, is getting bigger. The surface area is not dropping off. And that tells us the intensity will drop off with distance. Now, uh, here's an example we can take a look at. Example 15.4 uh, is looking at earthquake intensity. Oh, let's see if we got this right. Uh, the intensity of an earthquake P wave, now those are the longitudinal ones, right? Uh, traveling through the Earth and detected 100 kilometers from the source. So, hey, an earthquake, uh, we're going to use a model like this. So there's some kind of a you know, shift that takes place down deep inside the Earth and energy propagates out, there's a disturbance set up, it propagates through the material, and that means that the energy is spreading out 
as it travels away from that central event that happened. So a lot of potential energy is released, and now you're putting um, different parts of the, the material of the, of the planet uh, into motion. Okay, so what it's saying is that uh, we've identified uh, from our earthquake detector, we've identified the location of the earthquake. It was 100 kilometers away. And the, what we measured was a million watts per square meter at kind of the peak of the earthquake. So maybe when the earthquake was uh, jostling things back and forth the most, our meters went as high as a million watts per square meter. That happened to be the intensity of the earthquake at that location. Now that's not saying the total amount of power. The power was radiated uh, the energy was radiated in all directions. So we would have to um, combine that with all of the energy that headed out in different directions. Anyway, this is the intensity we picked up. What's going to happen at a location 400 kilometers from the source? So we should have, I guess we should, maybe I, oh I did. Very good. Okay, so here was where the source of the earthquake was. That was the event that set everything off. We're going to treat that at, at, at some location with, within the Earth, within the planet. Um, and 100 miles from that is where we first measured it. What would happen at a location 400 miles, assuming it's con continuing to travel through the planet? Uh, so we'll say the distance here is uh, 100,000 meters. That's 100 kilometers. And the intensity measured was a million watts per square meter. Now, we can work backwards to calculate the total amount of power uh, of the earthquake event during the time of the earthquake. Now, I don't know how long it lasted, but if we put the IA in here, and we're using 4 pi r squared. Why are we using that for an area? And the 4 pi r squared is the surface area of a sphere. So we're saying that... Uh, the intensity, the intensity at point B, oh here we go, the intensity at point A depends on the rate at which energy is being generated at that central event divided by the surface area of a sphere and at point B it's going to be still the same value of P. So the energy we started with, um, it's still the same rate of energy being generated uh, as we move farther and farther away, the intensity will drop off. But the total amount of power is a value that applies to each location. So uh, we calculated the total amount of power by taking IA times 4 pi r squared. So at least at the peak of the earthquake, energy was being radiated away at a rate of 1.26 10 to the 17th watts. That's a lot of watts. All right. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, you know, 1.10 to the 17th joules per second were being generated and then uh, being transported away from that site. Now that we know what the total power is, we can come back for point B and plug the numbers in. Now, you'll notice here that uh, distance B and distance A, they're related by a factor of four. And since the intensity is going to drop off like r squared. If I go four times as far away, it should drop off by a factor of 16. It should drop off by a factor of 4 squared. So let's take a look and see. Uh, I put the numbers in. The intensity that I calculated is 62,500 watts per square meter. Uh, well, oh, here it was, a million. So we started out with a million, and sure enough, the ratio of the two intensities is a factor of 16. So, um, so yeah, that's how we would do these calculations. Now, one thing to be aware of with all of this is that we're assuming that there are no damping effects taking place. We're assuming that as the wave, uh, as the disturbance propagates through the material, um, there is no damping. And so all of the energy is maintained as kinetic energy propagating through the material. None of it goes thermal. 
And that's not going to be true. So in reality, you are going to lose energy to thermal effects as the, um, as the wave propagates. So here, it's, it's kind of an idealized set of formulas, assuming that we can account for all of the energy no matter how far we get away from the source. Uh, we, we can account for the energy if we take thermal energy effects into account. So uh, with damping, you would leave residual thermal energy along the way. Uh, and not all of that energy would reach the more distant uh, stations that are trying to measure this effect. Okay, how are we doing with time? We might have time to go just a bit farther here. Uh, let's take a look at the mathematical representations that we could use for a traveling wave. So what we've been looking at so far are traveling waves. Uh, those are waves that have some kind of a wave speed to them. You might be thinking, well, don't all waves travel? Uh, but later on in the chapter, we'll be looking at, at something called standing waves. And we'll see how standing waves are related to traveling waves. Now, uh, the idea here is if we're going to represent something that's propagating, what we can do is we can take a snapshot of the profile. And that's what they've done here. So they're calling big D the pattern of displacements. So if you look, there's a pattern of displacements along different locations within the medium. If I go through the medium and I step and I go, oh, what, are, what, are the, the, what are the displacements look like here? What are the displacements here? What are the displacements here? And when we draw that wave, we're keeping track of all of the displacements. Which parts of the medium are, are displaced in this direction? Which parts are displaced in the other direction? Um, oh, they're calling this Y. Why are they? Uh, oh, because this is X. I see. Got it. So X is along the length, and uh, Y is keeping track of, let you just call that D, right? This should be the displacement D. So take that out and put big D in there. And what they're using is they're using a sine function. And what they've done is they've plugged in the wavelength um, and said that when X equals a full wavelength, that the sine function completes a cycle. And so they put an extra factor of 2 pi in there uh, to show that we've gone through a full cycle whenever x is equal to a multiple of a wavelength. Now, the wave at t equals 0 is here, but the wave at some later time, that profile will have shifted. And so we've got to keep track of that distance. It's going to travel a distance v times t um, you know, during a time interval t. Now, what they've done then is they've gone, okay, I saw what the function looked like when um, there was a snapshot, and now I'm going to bring in a time dependence. So there's going to be a time dependence taking place here, and the way to bring the time dependence in is to take the function, function just used to be a function of x, but now we've made it a function of x minus vt. Now, I, I'm hoping you remember from your, from your calculus classes when you're doing functional analysis. How do I take a function and shift it to the right? And the way you take a function and shift it to the right is you take that function of x and then say x minus a. And that will shift it to the right by an amount a. Well, for us, the amount a is variable. What we want is a function that steadily moves to the right at a particular speed, and so we put v times t. So at t equals 0, it looks like that, but as t increases, this sine function will be shifted to the right. Now, what would we do to get a sine function so that it's traveling to the left? And to have the sine function traveling to the left, we put a plus sign instead of a minus sign. Now, um, to kind of clean this up, the stuff going on inside this sign, it looks complicated. I got 2 pi, I got the wavelength, I've got all these things going on. What we do is we define a radiance frequency, which, which we've done before. That's not something so new. And that's given by 2 pi times f. But what is new 
uh, now that we have this disturbance propagating along some distance, is we're going to introduce something called the wave number. Now, for the wave number, we use the symbol little k. We haven't used little k for anything else, have we? Oh yeah, we've used little k for everything, right? So, this little k, no, it's not the spring constant. It's not kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is a capital K. Um, I have, I have, I don't know if it's good news or bad news. We, I have news for you, and that is, we use little k to mean a lot of stuff. So you do have to be able to pick this up from context. In any case, the wave number is kind of the inverse of the wavelength. So if I have a high k value, that means I've got lots of wavelengths packed into a short distance. Uh, so think about it, you know, stare at it, think about what k is keeping track of. What it's doing for us is it's simplifying our formulas. The same way that omega worked really well for frequencies, k is going to work really well for keeping track of how the wave is stretched out along, a, along distances. So the omega is keeping track of how the disturbance uh, behaves in time, and k is telling us if I take a snapshot and look along the length of it, how 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 wavy, how you know how compressed are the waves or spread out are the waves going to be? Um, and again, this is uh, oh, the units are wrong. Oh my gosh, I did that. I got to get that changed. So uh, the frequency here is in radians per second. This is wave number. This is in radians per meter, so that definitely needs to get changed right away. I can't believe I wrote that. So, radians per second, radians per meter. Um, boy, that's one I might have to go back and... All right, uh, that's probably that's a good place to stop. So, I'm going to go ahead and stop there, I think, for right now. Uh, and we'll come back and we will pick that up. All right.